Oh, that's really great. Oh, bear. Are we live? <laughs> Hi, sweetie. <laughs> Better looking. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. Fabulous. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's been a couple of weeks. Just somebody's breaks out on the street there. It's the Mission District after all. It's a noisy neighborhood. Hi, it's good to see you. It's been a couple of weeks, I know. Uh, we are trying something brand new today. Um, we are trying... YouTube's super chat function. Man, look at all those comments going past. Um, we want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you to uh, Da Build, Ethan Corton, and Break Build Repeat. Uh, they showed their support for Tested before we even started this live stream. They've been awesome and it's super appreciated. The money that we make here goes to supporting our Tested crew, uh, small builds, and all the things it takes to produce for this channel. As you can imagine, like, uh, all other YouTube and uh, online content creators, um, you know, the graph is down right now, but we're still maintaining and everyone is still employed. And that is freaking fabulous and feels like a very lucky and wonderful grace. Uh, and hell's bells, Margaret. I'm taking my moments of grace where I can find them these days. Uh, early morning walks with Maggie in Golden Gate Park are one of them. I'm doing that uh, most days of the week with Mrs. Don't Try This. And I groomed Maggie yesterday. She may show up and you get to see. Uh... <laughs> it's a terrible grooming job that I do, but it makes her all smooth. She's like a wire terrier. So we had her for probably nine, eight years before we groomed her at all. So, you know, like she had really rough, rough fur. And then we discovered there was a smooth dog underneath. It was really awesome. And especially as the weather gets hotter, um, her having lots of fur, she just sits there and pants. It's pretty rough. So uh, we actually started to groom her during that, that, that heat wave we had here in San Francisco, I think now three years ago, where it was over a hundred degrees here in the city of San Francisco. Okay, um, I'm gonna begin with a show and tell. Uh, I have been burning the, 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 the creativity in this shop over the past three months. Um, we're putting out five videos a week um, and I'm ahead of our inventory by a fair bit. I've been making more than that uh, and it's been incredibly productive. There's also been plenty of less frustration and tons of mistakes and those will come out in the videos. But in addition to doing all the stuff that I've been doing on camera, I've also been doing plenty off camera. Um, it's sort of like the breath that I need to take. Uh, let me just switch this down a little bit. It's sort of like the breath that I need to take between shooting stuff. Um, and it's funny because the more I'm filming everything with my phone, the more guilty I feel when I build something and don't film it. And that at the same time, just having that space is really important. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I participated uh, twice in Discovery's uh, wonderful broadcast of the SpaceX Dragon 2 launch that got two astronauts to space from American soil for the first time in a while. Uh, and that was thrilling. It was great to participate with my friends Mark Rober and Mike Massimino. I love Mass. He is so awesome. Um, and as part of that, I like started breaking out a bunch of my spacesuits as set pieces. And then, I, I, so I built the last spacesuit, the most recent spacesuit that I built was a couple years ago for New York Comic Con. I built the, uh, a replica of the orange ACES suit uh, that the shuttle astronauts wore for almost the entirety of all the shuttle missions, that classic, what they call the pumpkin suit uh, with a parachute harness. And we covered its build on tested extensively and uh, all the different collaborators I had. And I ended up making, well, the third suit's still in progress, but I ended up making three complete suits. 
Um, just because it's only a little harder to make more than one of something if you're making one of something. And uh, one of the things I made was I made three of these helmets. And this is, again, a, a basic form, a wonderful 3D basic form that I got off Turbo Squid, uh, hand painted or uh, 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 painted by uh, Sean Thorson. And then uh, the, the visors by Bill Duran and uh, just wonderful collaborations all up and down. But because I made three helmets, as you can imagine, this usually happens. If I make more than one of something, usually one of them is like, I consider it like the, the perfect one. The one that is oh, just, just tight as a drum. And that's this one. Um, the average viewer, even a close-up viewer, might not be able to tell the differences between one of my regular helmets and my hero helmet. Actually, that's super instructive. I'm going to grab the regular one. Right away. So here is, yeah, this has most of the things. Here is uh, one of my regular helmets. And this one is my hero. And what are the differences? Well, there's a few major and minor differences. One difference is this little uh, uh, lifting bar clamp up here. This one was from the 3D print. It is accurate in the shape. Uh, it is not, and it's actually fairly accurate in the size, but I wanted a functional one. So I reached out to my friend, Chris Gilman, who runs Global Effects, the makers of just spacesuits for every movie you could possibly think of, and said, do you have a, a good bailout bar clamp for an Asus helmet? Do you, do you have something? And he, he, he did. And he supplied me with one that actually is functional. It actually, I don't know whether this is cast from real pieces, but it is... It's beautiful. I'm actually considering taking this apart and seeing if I can't machine a couple from scratch. Um, this also has uh, on these, this part here, there's is this wide ring riding around a central uh, bushing made out of Delrin. Um, and both parts are made out of plastic because I was working with some 3D printed nylon parts, which were great. For my hero helmet, I decided to remake that ring out of aluminum just because I wanted it to be like rock solid. Um, the other major difference between the two helmets is the interior. You can see a little bit of uh, a gesture made to parts of the interior detailing, but on my hero helmet, well, there's it's about as accurate as I could possibly make it. Um, I hand machine all of these little boxes in here. The uh, This back pad, which is Velcroed in is actually beta cloth supplied by the generous and wonderful Ryan Nagata. That's just delightful. I've got, of course, my Savage Worm logo sticker in there. Can you see that? Yeah. And the last part I made for this was the connector. And I'm really, really pleased with it. Uh, it is, I've even got a little serial number on there wrapped under capped on tape for the added authenticity. It doesn't communicate any actual information. And I don't have the spray bar that uh, cools the inside of this helmet. Yeah, maybe I'll have to make that at some point. But that's my, uh, that is my show and tell of these two beautiful, beautiful examples of obsession. Oh, I just love seeing them in the frame. Oh, that's the other thing I did with this one. Ah, okay, there's this one last thing which you should note. Um, do you see, is it possible to see, oh, let's see if I can, <clears throat> this yellow bar here, uh, this this white sort of hairband <laughs> at the top of the visor um, on my hero helmet, I actually I actually painted it with a clear yellow lacquer because one of the things that's really visible on all of the Asus helmets is um, sun damage. You can see the ultraviolet yellowing of many of the parts and the pieces. And I attempted to replicate that with some guitar lacquer and yellow uh, and yellow color. Um, I think I still have, I mean, I threw a cup of coffee on this too to sort of dirty it up, but I think I still have some more work to do to make this look a little bit more beat up and old. Uh, I have an open invitation and the next time, look, when, when we start to travel again, man, I can't, tell you how much I can't wait to get on an airplane. I mean, you know, safely, Avi. Uh, 
But one of the places that I'm looking forward to going is Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Um, hello, everyone at Johnson. It's, uh, I really can't wait to get there again. Um, the ACES suit was made with some help from the Johnson, from folks at Johnson. And one of their, own, their only requests in supplying me with that help was, would I please bring the suit that I made and show it to them? And so I am going to take my ACES suit to Johnson, of course. I think I might even put it on while I'm there. Come on, of course. Uh, okay. So now we're going to use the super chat function and I'm going to take some questions. Let's see. Da Build says, uh, thank you for inspiring people like me on building stuff. Here, I can bring this over so I don't have to. There we go. Thank you for inspiring people about building stuff. I do have a quick question. How did you manage before you had your lathe? It's personally opened a world of possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I operated for years without any machine tools, um, but it is really true. A lathe, even more than a mill, is so crazy useful for a, a general maker. Uh, and there are so many different grades. You know, there are the, the, the I just want to tell you, like, if you find one that's really, really cheap, I'm not sure if you don't know machining that I would buy a super cheapo, cheapo lathe. Um, I have used some really cheap ones and I have used some really uh, high-end ones. And the problem is this, if you don't have any machining experience, you don't know what you're not getting with a cheap one. If you do have some machining experience, by all means, go get a cheap one and you can dial it in pretty finely. Uh, I had an Enco, Enco, E-N-C-O, uh, benchtop mill, it's about 600 pounds. And that was the first mill I had in this shop. And those are terrific, but they require a lot of finessing to get them to be ready for prime time. Um, before that, I actually had a beautiful, um, I think it's German, but I'm not sure, Emco Compact 5. Um, I was actually, I was sold that lathe mill combo by Mitch Romanowski, my mentor, my late uh, early model making mentor. Uh, and I used it for years. And that thing, pff, right out of the box, that thing was dialed in. Those are those are beautiful machines. Um, before a lathe, man, I would chuck stuff into my drill press and grab a file or a die grinder. I would do basic milling with Forstner bits. I had a, a an XY table that I bolted to my drill press table. And I mean, I had a really cheapo... Uh, old San Franciscans might remember Post Tool, which was there on South Bend Ness and DeBose. Um, and Post Tool went from, in the early 90s, it was like the cheapo tool store. And then in the mid 90s, it became the slightly more high end tool store. Uh, and uh, yeah, I bought this drill press from them that was like, you know, you had to adjust the belts, change them on the wheels in order to change speed. And I mean, like uh, most drill presses, right? It, it is a luxury and it's more expensive to buy one that has an automatic uh, speed shifter. Um, but I'm going on way too long. That, but look, every tool that you get that becomes useful to you becomes useful because it opens up new rooms in your brain. And uh, like you, the build, I found that a lathe opened up entire new stadiums of possibilities in my head once once I had them, once I, once I had one. And even now, I still have to wrap my head around the fact that if something's not working, I can remanufacture a part that's broken to a high fidelity with these tools. I keep forgetting, there are times when I forget that that is possible. Um, recently, wait a second. Where did I put it? Oh, no. Wait a second. Where did it go? So I had this thing. Oh, right, right, right. Sorry. Um, on my mill, I ha uh, it has a fine feed uh, ability like any bridge port where you can use a hand dial to operate the, the quill in the Z direction and the up and down direction. Usually you just have the quill handle, but there is a functionality within a bridge port mill to use a fine wheel. But because of the DRO I have set up on my mill, the fine wheel I had didn't fit anymore. So the, this, this 
l- late last week, I manufactured this um, off of this is the hand wheel I pulled off my table saw just a couple of weeks ago. And I machined it all the way down. And I actually included a little label, which I'm going to start to do. Fabricated Adam Savage 620. I like that. I, I feel like uh, I feel like I need to do more of this on the functional, useful things that I make for this space. Um, and you know, you always think you'll remember when you made something, and you won't. Sign and date your work. Uh, Break, build, repeat asks. When it comes to replicating props or costumes from either animation or movies, what advice, tricks of the trade, do you have for getting sizing or scale correct? if no practical prop is available. This one's really, really tough. Um, Cameras distort things way more than you expect they would. And everybody has their bias about the size they think something should be. In general, I have found that when I size something as best I can to reference information, and in the future from that moment, I have actually obtained or held or been able to measure the real object, in general, I'm usually about 15% oversize. So I take that into account. I kind of automatically take that into account. Um, But you're asking for tricks of the trade. The first trick of the trade is to gather all the pictures you can of the prop. Now that means doing a Google image search. That means going to tools in Google image search and choosing size. You want the largest size you can get because that affords you more detail that you can witness and see. Um, gather every, every picture you can think of because there are going to be details you cannot see at the moment you start the build that will become your life later on. Um, There might be a plug, there might be a sticker somewhere you didn't know about, but it's in your reference material. I can't tell you how many times I've poured over hundreds of images of a thing and then discovered some new facet of it and gone through my images and found many pictures of that thing and I had never noticed it before. That is just guaranteed. Gather every picture you can. Storing information digitally is inexpensive. So that's the first step. Second step is to start to uh, look for the images that are orthographic, that are uh, uh, that show. Okay, here's a, a about to weather this this afternoon. Um, this is a headpiece of Staff of Ra. So you might find pictures of it like this on a table, and this on a table. You gather all of those, but what you're really looking for is one in which someone's holding it up, you're, or, or a face-on picture, edge-on pictures. Um, you might find these in auction houses. You might actually go search Christie's and Sotheby's profiles in history. Uh, you might look at yourprops.com, uh, Flickr, absolutely. If you know one of these props is in a museum, it might be up on that museum's page. Again, you're gathering all of these images. Then when you have the ones where you think you have good orthographic views um, and you know it's like you know the thing is circular and you have a picture that's circular because you don't like these like off angle like this, man, you lose your whole life in, in trying to suss out the detail of that. Those orthographic views are really important, but now what you need to look for, oh, every image you can. You want to know how else to gather the image is uh, stream the movie and screenshot it. I take tons of screenshots of every single uh, film prop that I'm looking for. And uh, now you can stream it. Well, now we're at HD, not 4K. Uh, But again, like this is a great way to get reference and specifically human reference, right? Because in the movie, the prop is being handled and you get to see fingers and hands on that prop and that might help you. It might help you to learn how tall Karen Allen is so that when she's holding on to the Ravenwood bar headpiece of the staff of Ra, you might be able to, I don't know, maybe you've got a friend who's also five, six. I have no idea how tall Karen Allen is, but maybe your friend is the same size. Hand her a circle and does it seem like the same as in the shot? That's literally stuff that I have done to surmise the size of things in, in films. Um, And then keep on double checking your work. Don't assume because you've got one. I mean, hands are 
are difficult, right? Because we all may be different heights, but our hands might also be different sizes, even if we're the same height. So then you look for other things like, is the prop next to a thing you know the size of? And if that's the case, okay, so here's one that I want to like let you see here. If there's one like this, right, where it's sitting next to something you know the size of, understand in two dimensions, this pen is trapezoidal. I know that your brain is telling you these two lines are parallel, but in the two dimension of the screen you're looking at, it's trapezoidal. And that means you've got to choose the size that is on the plane of the object that you're measuring. It gets this really crazy specific. Um, then once I feel like I have a, the size, and look, sometimes an auction house might actually say, this prop is exactly 3.18 inches high and 3.25 inches wide. Auction houses can be great about giving really specific size detail. So once you have what you feel like is the correct size, then for prop replication, one of the first things I do is I blow that prop picture I have. I blow all the pictures that I have that are reasonably orthographic. That is from straight on or side elevation or plan view. Um, and I print them exactly 100% full size. So I use Photoshop a ton for these operations. Uh, I'll even make large poster boards of multiple pictures of this thing under many different circumstances, all the correct size so I can really go in and compare detail. It's like making a murder board of the prop that you're making. Printing stuff out full size, I can't, again, I can't stress enough how useful that is when you are actively building the thing that you wanna replicate. I didn't realize I had so many tips and tricks for that. That was a great question, Build, Break, Repeat. Thank you. Um, I recognize your name. You've asked questions before. Um, it's already rendered, says, hello from Brooklyn. Hello, Brooklyn. I used to live in your beautiful borough, uh, 837 Carroll Street, to be exact, on Carroll at uh, 8th Avenue next to Prospect Park. I was there for a couple of years in the late 80s. Anyway. It's already rendered, wants to know, thank you, not only Adam, but the entire crew for the rich content and knowledge you've helped make the quarantine a bit easier to deal with. We really appreciate that. Um, for us too, actually, having, having stuff to do and having a job that is still actually able to afford us the salaries that our crew makes is uh, something that we are super, super grateful for and really grateful that it has provided some solace and succor to you because the same is true for us. All that being said, I will tell you, and we talk about this in the podcast today, uh, on uh, once a week, we have a tested all hands meeting with the whole tested crew. And this week, man, <laughs> the degree to which all of us are like over the feeling like a little bit ass kicked by the monotony. Not to say we're like done with this, right? That's not, not true at all. We're, we're not done with this, but it goes in waves, right? It goes in waves. It, it totally goes in waves. And the, when it, this was a, this week was down wave because the whole tested meeting was, everyone was just like, ah, oh, just look, <laughs> thousand yard stares on the entire crew. And again, to be honest, being able to see the shining faces of my colleagues is one of the great graces every week, even if we all feel like crap. <laughs> um, so thank you. Jessica Shea asks, have you made any art lately? What mediums have you used? I appreciate this question because it makes a distinction between what I do and Oh, other things that I do. And I'm here to tell you that I don't make that distinction. I recognize that there is a cultural distinction, right? Like uh, my perfect replication of an ACES helmet might not, uh, that might not be somebody's idea of art, but it's mine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a thing in special effects, and every special effects artisan who is watching can attest to this, is that special effects and the film industry in general is rampant with people saying, I used to be an artist. Now, let me tell you something about film people. Hi, film people. Hello. Uh, you either walk onto a set 
as an employee on your first day and you either find it intoxicating or a, just a bloody nightmare. There's very few people who fall in between those two states um, because a film set is a high pressure, super intense atmosphere where every mistake costs money right away. Uh, everyone is super professional and super good at their jobs and actually also probably super good at your job. And boy, will they know if you're not doing it right. And like, no one's going to hold back. They, the goal is to get the product. It's not about you. And some people love that pressure and some people don't. And those of us that love that pressure, man, I mean, I think every film person has a kind of a, a life tale in which the first time they stepped onto a set and felt the the stress and the strain was like, man, I got to get me some more of this. This is a long way of saying that's what happened to me when I first showed up on commercial sets and watched Jamie at work and learned from him and uh, became his right hand for a long time. And, and that was that was really, really important to me. And I also saw that that stress of the film set fed me creatively. I saw that the way the work was required, the way the problem solving was required, because art is essentially also simply problem solving. It's problem solving a type of narrative, depending on what you're what you're doing with it. Um, you always start out an art piece with a problem to solve. You might not end up solving the problem you set out to solve, but you end up solving a problem. And for those of us that love problem solving and, you know, there are industries that are all about that. Being a chef is being a 100% a problem solver all the time. A construction manager, right? And in film, when you love solving those problems, that feeds you, that fed me. And I noticed that as I got better in doing film industry work, I was doing less of the art that I was doing back home. But I made a resolution that I wasn't going to say I used to be an artist. So many people in film say I used to be an artist. And I, I get that frame, but I reject it. I don't think the same things are happening in my brain. Yes, I'm making something for commerce as opposed to something for social commentary. But again, like when I jumped into film and it doubled my income overnight, that was really, really important. That allowed me to start raising a family. Those were, those were considerations that I was making. And, and I recognize other people make different decisions under the same conditions. And that's also totally fine and completely valid. Um, but as far as am I making art? Yeah. You know what? I'm just going to tease. I'm going to tease a one day build that's coming up. Hold on. I'm just I'm just going to tease one thing that I made recently. Um, and I have to say, like, I love giant art things. Klaus Oldenburg is one of my all time heroes. Um, the soft toilet, the giant pencils just makes me smile, makes me laugh. Changes in scale are delightful. Um, yeah. So I've been making art five days a week, hours and hours every day. It's been kind of great. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I said, everything goes in waves. I've had some real crappy weeks in here and I've had some real transformative weeks, kind of like everybody. Um, it's been getting worse lately. What are you going to do? Uh, okay. Uh, Shauna Miller. I don't mean it's getting worse for me lately. I mean, it's getting worse in general lately and I'm feeling that. Um, Shauna Miller says, thank you and your team for the awesome videos. You are welcome. I appreciate that. Um, Martin Van Wessel asks, I love all the quarantine videos. Question, what have you you and the team learned of the solitaire filming and editing that you will carry to the future of Tested? That's a really good question. We haven't been discussing that yet because it hasn't happened yet. But it's definitely it's definitely changed the way it's changed everything, right? Um I mean, my style has changed based on feedback from Gunther and Joey over the past three months. You know, Joey early on was like, hey, it's funny when you point and hold the camera. So don't shoot that as B-roll. Just if you're talking, just turn the camera around and point at the thing you're talking about. I like that. Um, I noticed that they're both also cutting in all my camera adjustment as I'm like, ar, 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 and moving the cameras around. Um, all that, that... I really dig that. It works for me because, sorry, there we go. Um, I really like that because 
revealing, look, breaking the fourth wall was, was always my sense of humor from the earliest days of Mythbusters and also here, uh, revealing the artifice and talking about it, making it part of the narrative. To me, uh, it's like a big hug. It like draws you into the process, into what's actually happening. And we've always done that on Tested. Like Joey and Gunther have both kind of shown up in videos that they've shot, uh, either because I've needed solace or you could see me turning the camera and saying, maybe you should turn the camera off. I'll tell you one thing that is going to happen. One thing that is going to change is the reason, I've said this uh, before on, the, on these live streams, but the reason you're seeing more mistakes in the videos that we're airing these days is because I'm filming everything. Um, in the past, both Joey and Gunther have had moments with me where they've been filming. I have seen something that I've screwed up. I die inside. And then I turn to them and I'm like, maybe just turn the camera off for a little, little while. And they do. But we've been talking and I'm like, I, I think I'm going to stop asking you guys to do that and just sort of take it on the chin. Right. I, to be honest, it's harder to do when someone else is in the room than when you're alone. That, that, that's also true. So, in many ways, I think it's going to change everything about this, right? That it'll be fascinating. Uh, I get feedback from them, uh, both of those guys, about how the coverage is going. And then I'm watching all these videos as they air and seeing what works and what doesn't work in the ways that I like, you know, the things that I'm finding work for me, you know, how I'm speaking about this issue. Uh, holding the camera, like I, I love having a camera that's mounted on a thing. Um, but moving around with the camera is not something that occurred to me as as a as a as a viable camera handling technique. And yet, I love watching it in the videos. I think it's really neat to see a perspective shift and a changing the space in the room. So, in lots of ways, the way we've been filming is going to change the way we film in the future. Um, you know, I, it may be that. Um, that one of the one day builds that we should do, it occurs to me, is to do a one day build showing how exactly we shoot a video and the decisions we make in cutting it into a piece and how long it's gonna be and whether or not we're using music and stuff like that. Like all of those are decisions that those guys make, uh, that we are all making as we're, as we're putting these pieces together. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been kind of great. I, like the collaboration has felt very immediate. Uh, they're both wonderful cutters, Joey and, and Gutter. Uh, and I've been learning a lot. <laughs> uh, all right. Dan Howarth says, Adam and Tested, as I approach middle age, welcome. Mm. Creators like you give me help, hope that I'm not over the hill yet and can learn new skills. Thank you. I, I, uh, it's hard to explain how old I'm 52. It's hard to explain how old 52 was when I was a kid in the seventies, 50 being over 50 was old, man. That was, it was old. And I remember in the nineties when I was working with Mitch Romanowski, like I said, my mentor, when Mitch turned 50 and I was like, Whoa, the big five. Oh. And he was like, everyone says that. I don't know why 50 was old when I was a kid and it does not feel old now. It doesn't feel, I mean, and all my friends who are close to my age, slightly older, slightly younger, again, it, it feels like the, the window of cultural, what is old is shifting. But in addition to that, um, I don't. It's never too late to learn a, to learn how to do a thing, and do something interesting with that skill. It's never too late. It's my no. There's just there's no there's no point at which you give up learning stuff. That what 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 would be the point? Um, yeah. So I reject the term over the hill. Don't get me wrong. I'm losing muscle mass as fast as anyone. And when I wake up in the morning, my ankles hurt in a spectacularly mystifying way. But at the same time, yeah, you know, if I, I joke in the book that I wrote that if I could go back and tell my young self one thing, it would be use more cooling fluid. But in fact, I feel like the thing I want to say to 16, 17, 18 year old me, 22 year old me is you've got more time than you think. 
you also have less time than you think. I mean, we only get like 75 years here or so. You know, some get more, some get less. But in general, that's about the average. So it's a very short period of time. But really, within that space that we're all given, there's more time than you think. There, There's time. Yeah. Go learn something new. Do something with it. Man, it feels... It feels great. I mean, I'm always a little sad afterwards, but that's that's that creative art. You know, when you finish something, you feel awesome and elated as you're making something. You feel great. That starts to kick your ass. You finish, you feel, oh, now you feel really great that you finished it. And then there's a little postpartum, like, uh, and then, you know, the next week starts and you do the whole process again. James Monte Carbonari. What a great name. Uh, asks, how were the protests you went to these past couple of weeks in the Bay Area? Shout out to the whole test of crew, stay safe. The protests were so inspiring and so beautiful. Uh, the, the, the big protest here last Wednesday, uh, I spent about two hours right in the middle of it. And the last time I was in a crowd that thick, a long time ago. Uh, but I'll say a couple of things. Um, one, it was beautiful and peaceful protest and being among a bunch of your fellow citizens with a common cause, exercising your magnificent right to free speech is a beautiful thing uh, and super inspiring. And under my mask, I cried repeatedly every time one of the say their name, call in response happens. Yeah. Uh, everyone, everyone, Everyone was wearing a mask. There was one young African-American man on a horse in the middle of 18th Street and Dolores. Uh, he was not wearing a mask. He was above everyone. I didn't begrudge him not wearing a mask. I didn't feel dangerous from him. He was the only human I could see in the sea of what I believe is now agreed to be between 10 and 15,000. Everyone was wearing a mask. And I will say in San Francisco since then, everyone has been wearing a mask. And that... That community-minded thing feels really feels really great. So I have I feel like there's a long tail lingering effect from the protests here in the Bay Area. Um, I think uh, I I yeah. So I found the protests to be super inspiring. And while I know there are many parts of the country where all hell literally broke loose and the police did not comport themselves in any way that we want our police to comport themselves. But we are having that conversation about what we really want as a community from the people we hire and pay to serve and protect us. We are having that conversation. And no matter where you fall, that is a useful conversation to have. Frankly, I hope you fall on the side of social justice and equity because otherwise I don't think we have a lot to talk about, but yeah. Um, the protests felt, they feel like an inflection point, like the kind of inflection point that can lead in some universes to uh, super dystopia and in other universes to slowly building exactly the kind of world we want to live in. And that's that, that's really real and, and awesome. So I, I found them incredible. Uh, Joshua Harrell says, love watching the mistakes, keep it up and keep making. Um, there's a point at which in one of the builds I did, oh yeah, the Lego Sorter, the Friday at Five build, where the mistakes were coming so fast and furious that I was like, should I ask those guys to not cut them all in? Because it's just at a certain point, you're just like, I'm an idiot. I, I will say, speaking of all the mistakes and being open and free with them, that I was making something last week that I thought would be easy that was not. And... Um, there we go. That's not such an advertisement. Here, how's that? Uh, I was making something last week that was, I thought was going to be easy and turned out to kick my ass. And I screwed it up like really, really bad. Like I was working on it on the lathe at slow speed. Don't, don't worry. I didn't have an accident on the lathe. But I had a piece get wrenched out of the jaws on the lathe because I put too much force on the piece. 
So operating at very slow speeds, like four RPM, right? But still, three times on camera, three times on camera, this piece wrenched itself out because I didn't know how to do this operation. And something interesting happened, which was the third time it happened, I literally took a breath, walked around this shop. I did not clean. I did not sweep. I did not put a single tool away. I simply turned off the lights and I went home. That right there, that's interesting because usually in the mistakes that I make, uh, there is some form of self-admonition. There is some form of internalizing the mistake. It's the mistake is because I am at fault. Obviously that's true, but there are ways to take something and there are ways to take something. So when I say I'm internalizing, I don't just say the mistake happened because of me. Obviously it did. The mistake happened because I am flawed. That's, that's where you really internalize something and you say like, I'm stupid and you get mad at yourself. You're stupid. Literally, that's what the voice in my head has said to me for years under all sorts of different circumstances and still will for the rest of my life. I won't escape that. But within this frame of making this thing and screwing it up so royally with a camera close up on the screw up. So I realized in the video, people who use lasers are going to watch this. They're going to be like, Jesus, Adam, what the hell were you thinking? That's real. And yet at the end of that day, when I turned the lights off and I went home, I was not internalizing the blame. I was not, I was not taking it on the chin. I was pissed. I was pissed that it didn't work. I was disappointed, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't turning it into self abuse. <laughs> uh, hold on. Let me just double check that. Cool. Um, and that's significant. And I think some of that has been the sheer volume of work that I've been doing in here and the amount of mistakes I've been making that I've been filming and talking about. I, I, so like we're all learning animals. I'm 52. I'm still learning how to make mistakes without taking it too much on the chin, be able to move on from those. Iron Spine 481. You guys are really bringing the usernames today. I appreciate it. Iron Spine 481 asks, in the past you mentioned perfect movies, i.e. Raiders of the Lost Ark. 100% perfect film. Mm. Do you have a list of perfect films? Yeah, but it's ongoing. Uh, Iron Spine offers Ghostbusters as a personal choice. 100% Ghostbusters, another perfect film. Um, other perfect films, Brazil, I think of as a perfect film, um, galaxy quest, galaxy quest is a perfect movie. It's not a moment out of, out of, there's not a frame. That's not just absolutely right on the money. Uh, broadcast news, broadcast news. I have to tell you, we watched that a, a, maybe three or four years ago. We showed it to the boys and it holds up 100 percent um everybody in that movie is incredible oh it is so good yeah broadcast news another perfect film this is and the way i talk about movies is there are movies that are there's so many categories everyone's always saying as a conversational gambit what are your top five favorite films and i immediately start by going look there's at least 30 films in my top five full stop because I reject that you could possibly quantify what are your favorite of anything. There are all these different categories of favorites. So there are movies that you think of are perfect. I think that the, the Departed is perfect, except for that shot with a rat. Everything about The Departed is like, I wouldn't change a thing. I love every second of that movie, except for that one shot. So that's one of those films that if it's on, I'll turn it on and walk, watch all the way through. Um, so there are perfect movies. There are movies you think of are perfect, but those might not be your favorite movies. You might realize a film is perfect, like it's a wonderful life. It still might not be a film you want to watch. That so those that right, those are different categories. Then there are films that are really important to who you are. Like for me, Brazil and Blade Runner, Time Bandits, all these early Gilliam films are really important in the makeup of who I am. Um but some of them, like I've watched Brazil so many times, I can't watch it anymore. I've literally watched Brazil like over 200 times. 
I've told the story before. I don't need to tell it again right here. But yeah, so I can't watch that movie anymore. It's as important as it is to me, as perfect as it is, as a as a as a piece of art, as a piece of cultural uh, commentary. It's incredible that I can't watch it anymore. So again, like favorite is a very loosey goosey category, and I like to get more specific. Um, there are films that taught me about how to love film. Apocalypse Now, definitely not a perfect movie, but like. That shot of Martin Sheen coming out of the water, I saw that when I was 17 and it changed my brain's understanding of what film could be. That was neat. That felt really cool. Um, Vicky Bly, any relation to Captain? Vicky Bly says, thanks so much for everything. You and the Tested crew are appreciated. We, we, we thank you. Um, one of the things we talk about each week as we go over our tested all hands meeting is we talk about how we've done that last week, how many streams, what we've done in terms of all the different metrics by which we see how we're doing. Uh, and we also call out comments and, and complaints and compliments that people have. And I, we really appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's a good team. Um, I'm slowly starting to see members of the tested team from a distance here and there. And that is, that is really nice. Um, I miss, I miss all those folks in person, man. I miss people in person. I'll tell you, you know, one thing that the, 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 the protests uh, taught me, cause I've been afraid as I've been walking around the last three months and I'm seeing all the frankly, like 25 year old white dudes who seem to refuse to wear masks and even their girlfriends are wearing masks and they're not wearing a mask. What the hell? What the hell? Come on. And I'm seeing that and it's making me feel like I don't want to be around people. And it's one of the things that's so great about since the protest, seeing everyone wearing masks, everyone's caretaking and being a citizen. That's great. That's, that's right. And that's proper. Um, but I was starting to get afraid pre the protest. I was starting to get afraid. Am I becoming agoraphobic? Is that what's happening here? Am I like just going to not want to be around people at all? Cause look, I'm an introvert extrovert. Obviously I'm an extrovert. I don't mind being in public, I don't mind talking about whatever comes to my head. But I also am also an introvert. Like I, I have my wife's and my evenings and weekends are very quiet. How we have very close friends we see on a frequent basis, but for the most part, we're not going out every night by any stretch of the imagination. We're not even going out like more than three times a week at the most. Maybe, maybe. Actually, way less than that. Maybe three times a month? Yeah, no. So, like, I need that downtime. But here I was starting to become afraid. Like, well, what is social life going to be like after this, right? So, being in the middle of that protest showed me that I was not terrified of all those people and the potential disease they carried. Because in the two hours I was in the middle of that crowd, I brushed against maybe three people, I think only two. And I mean, like... That, that is how assiduously everyone in the Bay Area was maintaining some distance that could be maintained within this dense throng of people. And that was inspiring. <coughs> uh, Adam, tools come in corded, cordless, and, pneumat and pneumatic. What do you choose for different types of tools and why? That's a great question. There's actually a... Wait a second. Oh, hold on just a second. I think I have something as an example for this, but yes, yes. So, um, so I'm gonna, in order to answer this question, I'm gonna talk about Sanders for a second. Um, give me a sec. Go. Okay, so. Um, this is a super awesome tool called a finger sander. And this is an amazing tool. I first came across this tool in the early 90s, and they were expensive back then, probably like 40 bucks, which for me in the early 90s was like I had to save up for a couple couple months to have the disposable income to spend $40 on a tool. Um this is basically a pneumatic to a pneumatic belt sander that runs this really small belt. And these are phenomenal for model making. These afford you the ability to dial in and they make different grits of belts. Uh, and I have a bigger one that's the, basically the same tool, only a little bigger with a fatter belt. 
Uh, and that's all that I've ever seen in finger sanders for 25 years. And then recently, I came across this one. Um, I discovered Proxon, which is, a, 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 I think, a Swiss company, German company. can't remember which. I'm sorry. Um, European. They're Euro European company. And they make a battery-powered... They make a battery-powered uh, finger sander that is um, that has a movable finger, and it's corded. And look, I bought it because the finger sander has been so useful to me over the years. And the question as to which one of these I will use under what circumstances, well, because I still think in terms of this tool, this is the one I reach for. I have to remind myself that this one exists. Um, and I haven't yet done a, one day a, a tool tip about this. But I must say, I really like the build quality of Proxon's tools. I really like the feel of them. I super dig this Euro mustard and terrapin green color. It's, it's like really, really nice. Um, the, the, the speed controls on them are intuitive. The, uh, they all have dust retrieval for the most part on their tools. Um, changing a belt is fairly trivial, uh, and belts were easy to find, which is another deal when you're buying a tool. You got to make sure you can buy the disposable, uh, expendable pieces of that tool. So, um, Really, this is the, the, the longest possible way of saying the answer to your question is I use what tool I think is best for the job. Um, so I don't necessarily prioritize pneumatic over corded over cordless. Obviously, I like cordless, but usually when you're sanding with one of these, you're doing it for long, long periods of time, and a cordless tool might not might not last that long. You don't want to keep switching batteries. So I like pneumatic for that. Now that I've got a corded version, I may find that there are things that is just fantastic for that I really dig. Like maybe it has, uh, you know, with, with these, there's no setting the speed. You've got to adjust it with this, with the, with the valve here, being able to set the speed. I may find that that like changes my whole life. I'm not sure. Um, I am agnostic as to what powers the tool that I am using. Uh, I'm sure if I was, had a shop a hundred years ago, it would be a water wheel and some central drive that everything plugged into that powered all the tools in my shop. Um, the, it's funny when you bring a new tool into your space though, you have to, you have to wrap your head around the fact that it exists. This is why organization is so important. If you can't see it, you can't use it. If it's not in the mental palace, it's not going to be useful to you. Uh, and so it's really important to me when I bring things in to label them all so that I can see them, what they are, what they're meant for. And I can find it. I, like I looked up the first place this went was on a shelf up there. And then I moved it to a shelf down there. I'm glad I didn't move it too much farther. Um, my, my mode with organization these days is uh, I try, if I'm wondering where to put something, I think if I needed this right now, where would I look for it? Um, I had a name for this. What was this? I came up with this. Intuitive... I actually came up with a name for this process. Um, and now I can't remember what it was. I came up with it a couple of nights ago. I wrote it in my notebook, but my notebook's too far away for me to run during a live broadcast. <laughs> uh, I will, uh, I, it'll come up again. It will definitely come up again because that's, being able to retrieve stuff uh, is one of the most important aspects of having a shop. <clears throat> Arvid Nilsson asks, do you still film everything on an iPhone or do you now use, use other camera equipment? No, it's all the iPhone. Um, I even have a GoPro Hero 5 in my bag I keep on meaning to bring out. I just honestly, within my, my personal workflow, I don't want to worry that, too, that much about cameras. Yeah, that's, that's it. I'm lazy about learning a new thing about a new camera and how it's, and I know it's not that much. I get that it's not that much, but like the allocation of the limited resources I have within this thing is such that the iPhone is the perfect amount of low friction camera utility that I, uh, that I use. Um, there's one thing I have, actually, Joey Gunther, if you're watching, here's a question. 
Um, I go back and forth between using Hyperlapse, a time-lapse program I love because you can change and choose uh, the frame rate of your time-lapse after you've shot it, and using Apple's ingrown time-lapse function within the camera app. <clears throat> and I recognize, I don't, I use Hyperlapse much more because it allows you to make longer time-lapses. I think the Apple time-lapse makes every video roughly the same size or it compresses them according to an algorithm that I can't control very much. So I don't use it a ton, but I was just, I'm curious, like, uh, is one of those better than the other? This is about as far as I'm willing to go in the decision-making of, of camera equipment. The hyperlapse or the camera apps, time-lapse. As far as using new equipment, I'm just not there yet. I did add some more lighting in here and actually uh, Gunther and Joey will be pleased to know that for one of their, they, they place some lamps in here for filming high up so that the lighting's a little better. Um, and I added a power strip for one of their lights yesterday. Yeah, you guys are welcome. Um, GTJ, GTJ. Okay, GTJ says, thanks, just dot, 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 thanks. And thanks for the ellipsis, one of my favorite pieces of punctuation. The ellipsis is both overused and underused, but I really appreciate it. Um, Ethan Corton asks, what gave you the idea for the tattooed ruler? By the way, the tattooed ruler on my arm, there there you can see it, my, my tattooed six inch, 15 centimeter ruler on my arm um, is how I got recognized at the protest, by the way. <laughs> I was holding up my sign and a guy and his son were like, Ah, hi. <laughs> um, how accurate is it? It's accurate enough to sort nuts and bolts. Uh, uh, how long have you had it? I've had it since January of 2019. I got it just before we went into filming production on Savage Builds. It seemed appropriate. Um, and what gave me the idea? I actually came up with the idea like probably 12 or 15 years ago. Uh, I was thinking, what's a useful tattoo? And I might have, I can't remember if I came across, it definitely was like, it definitely, I, I, I definitely hadn't seen it at that point. Since then I have seen it. Um, I definitely hadn't seen it at that point. And there was, <clears throat> I, like I remember that first, the first American Chopper, which wasn't called, sorry, not American Chopper, the first Monster Garage, which wasn't Monster Garage. It was a documentary about Jesse James and the old kind of tools that he used to build motorcycles. I don't know if you've ever seen it or if you remember it, but it's stunning. And you get to see Jesse before Jesse was famous. You see just all this pure delight and joy in the making of things and the unpacking of old tools and old technologies to do the things that he wants to do. And I remember he had... Um, he had a tattoo on his palm, pay up sucker. I don't know why that, I, there's also a chef who had a palm tattoo or two palm tattoos of dotted lines and one's a tablespoon of salt and one's a teaspoon of salt. I think that might've been part of my inspiration. I can't quite remember. I think I remember Jesse James, it's the pay up sucker on his palm was in payment for a motorcycle and his wife was pissed off that he took that as payment instead of money. This, this, this the, that, that I, I hope that airs occasionally on discovery because it was a super delight and I, I really connected with the the craftsperson and their love of the craft it was fantastic motorcycle mania someone tells me thank you Kalo. um david battilotti says it's hard not to conflate mistakes and failure both in ourselves and others they are not the same thing this is totally true this is totally true it is so hard not to conflate those things. Yeah. And the world is so mystifying. I think that part of it is that the world is just mystifying, right? Like spend time around your parents. They drive you crazy. They make you super happy. And you don't know why either of those things, right? And you unpack those through the course of your life. And it's a mystifying ordeal. Sometimes you learn stuff about yourself. A good portion of the time you don't. And, you know... It's easy to internalize because we it's easy to internalize the blame because we feel so flawed, each one of us. And then we are. We are. Uh, Lee Marsh asks, 
Will you be showing any more of your Acto-1 build? I am making one, and I enjoyed your weathering ideas. I will as soon as I get some more parts from Eagle Moss. I have uh, it's still sitting on the edge of my table saw over there. Uh, kits 1 through 10, fully assembled. Um, the moment some more show up, I plan to jump right back in. I can't wait. I, I Look, I am all about Ghostbusters. It's one of the great movies ever made. Um, and the new Ghostbusters, man, Jason Reitman's new Ghostbusters. I am so freaking excited for it. I can barely stand it. It's killing me that it's not coming out this summer. <sighs> uh, yeah. So soon. Joey Pomeroy suggests that I should do a live stream of a one-day build. This is a this is definitely something we have talked about. Specifically because I have done a couple of live builds in front of audiences over the past few years. Um, one of them is uh, one of them was I built a Strawn based one of Tao Janssen's walking robots. I built a ten or twelve legged, maybe six or eight. I can't even remember now. A multi legged Strawn based, and I built it in the Exploratorium's courtyard over three days, uh, and that was fascinating. That was Building stuff in front of people is is fascinating. Uh, then I, uh, at the first NomCon, I helped Jen Schachter and we, the builders, put together their giant Rosie the Riveter. Uh, and then last summer at the Smithsonian Institution, um, I and a bunch of tested folks and makers from around the globe gathered together to assemble a, a replica uh, of the uh, Apollo Command Module hatch. And here's the thing about making stuff in front of people live that I really like. Um, I'm, a, I'm a storyteller and a performer, and I have done those things on stage. I've done them in movies. I've done them as a model maker. I've done them as a performer, as a science communicator. I've produced shows for television and for the web. It's every medium you can think of, I have tried to explore it in the, in the guise of telling stories and performing. I performed weddings, which again, as a performer, is a super fascinating type of performance. It's very different than any other kind. I performed at wonderful places like Largo, where the crowd is there to love you. And I've also performed at Cobbs, where the crowd is not necessarily there to love you. They're there to have a good time, but that's a very different circumstance. So every every venue, every, every, uh, 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 every execution of performance uh, yields different a different relationship between the performer and the audience. And I am fascinated by all those, all those relationships and what they yield in both in that interaction. And building something live in front of a crowd is substantively different than anything I've ever done. Um, there's a way in which, there's a way in which I am able to be myself that it's almost impossible under any, under any other circumstances because I'm actually having to solve real problems right there on the fly. And when it's good, I forget the crowd is there entirely. And in all those executions that I've mentioned, that happened repeatedly throughout the build. I forgot the crowd was there until they responded or laughed at some mistake that I made. And it felt like my own brain was speaking to me, except it was a whole bunch of people around me. Um, and I feel like performers that we, my personal feeling is that the performers would gravitate towards, we gravitate towards because they're revealing something about themselves. They're revealing something essential and that in that revelation, we all see ourselves and as, 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 as Emerson says, the soul always hears an admonition in such things. And it's really, really true. We, that exploration is important. And there's a way in which I feel like an audience seeing me build is they're getting access to a part of me that I almost can't reveal in almost any other, any other medium on that, you know, it would, it would potentially take too long. But all this is the, the, the TLDR here is I totally want to do a live one day build both on, on YouTube uh, or whatever medium we choose to do it on, but also live because I want more of that 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 energy that it it is intoxicating and great, especially working with other people you love. Um, 
I mean, it even happened in the stage show that I did with Jamie and then again with Michael Stevens. There were aspects of both of those shows that didn't work perfectly. And we often had to fix stuff on stage as we were performing. And both with Michael and with Jamie, I had willing partners who totally had no ego about things not working and were great about fixing it. And the audience just loved it. It was it was a fabulous exchange. Um, so, yes, more live building. Absolutely. Uh Eric Killian asks, thank you for inspiring this aerospace engineer to follow his passion. Oh, you didn't explain what your passion was, but you're welcome. Uh, question, what's one greedly you snuck into a build that makes you laugh? Mm. So, this would be going back to, I think, my more professional builds when I was doing models for film. Uh, you know, I, so I worked on Space Cowboys. I, uh, I did the interior of the space shuttle payload bay in Space Cowboys. And uh, we were a, a wonderful team of us at ILM. I mean, my collaborators on Space Cowboys at ILM were phenomenal. I think Lauren Peterson ran that job. Uh, oh my God. Yeah. Brian Dewey, Brian Cardan, Carol Bauman. We had some amazing people. And uh, Dewey was working on the Russian uh, rocket laser Bomb. Yeah, I can't even remember now about the plot of the movie. But anyway, Brian Dewey was working on this this part, and we we ended up model making uh, this specific part of it using the Universal Greebly. It's a little dome with four little uh, pips, one in each corner, and oh, my connection is unstable. We're trying to reconnect. Is it working fine for you? Okay, I'll keep on. Oh, there we go. So, at any rate, we put this uh, we put these Universal Greeblies in this detailing part of the Russian ship, and then it turned out that they built a full size version of this as part of the set down in Los Angeles, and we got to see a set dressing crew's huge build of the Universal Greebly. Yeah, it was like this big. I wish I had saved it. I have screenshots of it. We can, I think we'll release some of these pieces of this live stream later on this week. And when we do, I'll make sure to include a picture of the giant, the giant expansive uh, Universal Greebly. Sir Wheels a Lot 3684 asks every piece of content but especially the one day builds have been what keeps me entertained during this COVID-19 situation the world is going through. Thank you. You are welcome. Um, again, we really appreciate the feedback. It is, uh, it feels very lucky to have within the social distancing that we've all had to do. And I don't know about you, but for me, I'm sequestered with my life partner my favorite person in the world. And I'm also sequestered with my mom. And that is great. I'm like, that's fabulous. And my kids are both safe. They're both safe and they're not in my house. It's ideal. It's just perfect. <laughs> uh, but not seeing my friends, not being able to socially see my friends has been the hardest part for me. That, that has definitely been the thing that I have taken on the chin. The monotony I can actually deal with. I have this space. I can construct the fiction that I have any control over the world repeatedly every day in this space. And that's great, but not seeing my friends is hard, but getting feedback from, uh, from you guys who watch these things and comment on them and talk about them and ask for different things. It's close. And I really appreciate that. So thank you. Uh, Tiffany esque asks, I printed four parts of the Rosie, the riveter. My question is, do you have any tips for someone who has very little workspace? Yeah. Um, it's tricky. It's tricky, man. It, I, I've had huge workshops. I've had workshops bigger than this. Uh, and I've had workshops way smaller than this. Uh, my first house that my wife and I lived in together, 
Um, I had a shop downstairs that was, I think, eight by 10 feet. Yeah. And uh, again, I, I, I'll share pictures of that. Uh, I have been inspired at times to ask my Twitter followers to share pictures of their small workspaces. And I think we've even built a couple of galleries, uh, some of the submissions to those on Tested. And they are really, really instructive. They're are so many ways to store your crap. There are so many ways to create a space in which you want to work. And this is the biggest thing is, it's not about the size of the space, it's about whether or not you want to work there. And there are all sorts of different requirements that people have for their inspiration. And some we don't even know, right? Like we find out new ways in which we get inspired. I, I, when I put these lights here on my work table, I had no idea how much they would engender me wanting to work at this table more and more and more because I could see things really clearly. I didn't know that was part of my process, but it was. So it's great to look at other people's executions of tiny workspaces, of the closets they've built a sewing room into or the bin that they have for doing model making so they can pull it out and work and put it back in. Um, I guess my tip would be the hardest part about working in small space is being able to, is being able to get started and then wrap up, right? Cause usually when you're in a small space, you're often sharing it with somebody else. And that means that you can't leave your crap all over the place. I mean, that's one of the great graces of having a shop is I can leave stuff on a table stage for days or weeks at a time. Um, I don't have that luxury if I have a roommate and I do actually. So, you know, you've got to pack stuff up in the living space because it's used for living. Um, so looking at other people's executions of how to do that is really, really, really useful. Um, we will, uh, we'll reactivate one of those galleries because it's, it's super inspiring to see what people have done. Um, and you know, the art stores and the hardware stores, they want to help you. They've got sorters. There's all sorts of different ways. Um, for me, the biggest issue is always about what's the lowest friction way for me to get started, right? Because when you feel inspired to go build something, if you then have to spend an hour setting everything up, that's, friction is real. Uh, so I guess my tip and trick would be to start thinking about if you only have eight square feet, what can you do with that with that square footage that affords you the most amount of uh, ability to get started and to keep organized? Yeah, I, I mean, I do it all the time here with all sorts of different things. So the one day build I did of my leather working tools is absolutely like localizing parts to a specific location. So it also depends on whether or not you're doing general model making or you're making one specific thing. Frankly, I feel like it would be easier if you were trying to make one thing to build a cabinet that serviced the making of that thing or to build a bin or to buy a bunch of sorters that allowed uh, that process to be as, again, as frictionless as possible. Um, yeah, I for me, I can't overstate how quickly I want to get started when I want to get started with something. That That's a big deal. Eric Notargia Como. I am mangling your name. I apologize, Eric, but Eric says, thank you. And I say, you're welcome. Absolutely. Um, Jacob T says, I remember your Dodo project a while back, but would you, that's a long time ago. Uh, but would you ever consider branching out and doing other recently extinct animals like a thylacine or great auk or something? Sure. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I will look into both of those. I've heard of the great auk. I don't know about the thylacine. Um, I mean, the dodo is compelling to me. The dodo is compelling to me specifically because it went extinct on our watch and we didn't care for the longest time. Like that's, that's significant, right? For all the, for all the lip service that science was paying to like, Oh, the wonders of the natural world this like greasy descendant of a pigeon that tasted crappy and like got decimated by rats brought to the island of Mauritius by the ships that were visiting it on their way out of Madagascar. Uh, uh, 
no one gave a crap about the dodo. And there's something about the hubris of the dodo that I find inspiring within the extinction story. I mean, obviously, that's why dodo is a stand-in for human hubris. That resonates to me. As for other animals that inspire me, that are interesting to me, I mean, I'm fascinated by the dinosaurs, obviously, like any like any functional human must be because it's astounding that earth was ruled by lizards at one point. It's fantastic. Uh, that's why a T-Rex skull is my pool table light. It's like my, my food chain mezuzah, right? It's I come in and I think this is what it would be like to be low on the food chain instead of at the top of it. That would suck. I know, and I also still have to finish that Dodo project. I will get around to that at some point. I, you know, I still have all these feathers. I have everything. It's all set up up there. I've got another space for feathers up in the loft. Feathers and wings are coming up soon. I'm just feeling a little more boiling under the surface about that. Fixter Jake 11 says, I just wanted to say thank you for pushing me towards the STEM field as a child. Did I call you directly? Uh, you're welcome. In December, he says, or she says, uh, I will graduate with a degree in computer science and already have a job lined up. That's fantastic. I, I am sorry that your graduation is probably going to be a remote and virtual graduation, but congratulations. Uh, you know, I think that STEM fields, we we still tend to think of them culturally as like an avocation, like you have to be inspired to go be a scientist. And while every scientist I know is inspired, I think it's culturally problematic that we, for me, when I thought about being a scientist, again, I've, I've long said this, I thought of it as something that smart people did. Like smart, inspired people, they went and did that. And I'm here to tell you that every scientist I've ever met loves their work so much. And if you follow different science Twitters, like herpetologist Twitter or birding Twitter, there's so much beautiful enthusiasm with every within every one of those disciplines for that discipline. Uh, I just think that like, Culturally, the thing is, the kid says, I want to be a singer. I want to be an artist. And their parents are like, you're never going to make any money as that. You're, just, you're never going to rise to the top of your field. And the answer is, you're probably not going to rise to the top of your field in any discipline that you go into. So why not science? Why not science? Like, actually, it could pay well. Uh, and every scientist I know loves their job. I'm not sure there's many professions I could say about that. That every scientist I've ever met who is working in their field loves their freaking job despite all of its difficulties. Um, so thank you, Fixter Jake 11 for sharing that story. Radu Bukur, again, I'm probably butchering your name and I apologize. How do you decide when to make or build something and when to buy? How do you decide between the satisfaction of creating your own stuff and the time saving of getting something that works just fine? That is just constantly moving target. That, that, that There's no hard and fast rule for that at all. Mm. I love purchasing the right the right solution to a problem. Um, I just did a uh, a video on hole saws on different ways of of cutting holes, and a friend of mine reached out and mentioned to me uh, that if I was doing that, I should know about these things, which are called annular cutters, and. Uh, Dude, I like, I can't wait. I can't wait to try these puppies out, right? Like this is a magnificent solution to a problem I already have a solution to, but I'm always looking for better ways to make big holes in difficult materials. Uh, so I love purchasing the right solution to a problem, but I also love like my hand wheel for the, uh, uh, wherever I put it, over here. I also love the hand wheel that I built for my mill. And frankly, this will be part of the mill for the rest of, this will be part of my mill for the rest of its life. I mean, don't get me wrong, but I, I don't want to get rid of this thing. I want to scrape the ways. That's what I want to do. It's ways or it's Y axis a little bit beat up. Um, and I'd like to be able to use this mill for the next 30 years. So I'm definitely going to 
I think, tackle that at some point. But this piece that I made, this will be part of this mill for the rest of its life. And that gives me great satisfaction. And it made me take more care in its execution and the chamfering and the pieces and parts that I used for it and the balance of how they look together. Uh, and frankly, looking at the little brass plaque that I put on this makes me so happy. Uh, I started looking around the shop for other things that I could make for the stuff that I have. I mean, when I made that speed control on the uh, portable bandsaw out of the old hand wheel, that made me super excited. So I guess it's a long way of saying, I guess I do prefer to make my own if I feel qualified and if I can make something that works exactly as I want it to. Um, sometimes buying the solution is an interim step between me learning how the thing works that's fine, and making one myself. Joel Brook asks, I just started learning carpentry. How do I differentiate between using a different tool that seems easier to use or accepting my lower skill level? That is a really interesting question. Uh, I am a believer that, mm, okay, I played the saxophone way back when I spent a couple of years uh, taking lessons and playing the saxophone. And I still have one, actually, a nice Con 10M from the early 70s, uh, one of the Naked Lady tenors, if you play the saxophone. And my sax teacher had a great axiom. He said, every time you find a mouthpiece that's better, that feels better than the one you own, you should do whatever you can to buy it. And that's non-trivial, right? Like, a metal saxophone mouthpiece at that point in the eighties was like a lot of money for me. Uh, but he was saying the moment you find something that makes, that makes the playing better for you, it's worth the money. It's worth whatever it's going to take to spend that, to make the saxophone experience better. Uh, and I, I love that philosophy. I think that's, that was a great thing that he told me. Uh, and I did. I bought two more mouthpieces over the years to get the one that I really like. And I really love the tone and the feel and the way it worked for me. And I think the same is true for tools. And I was saying it before about the difference between corded and cordless tools. It's not necessarily about the process by which power is imparted to the business end of the tool that concerns me. It's more about, does this make my job easier? Uh, so, I don't think you have to suffer with your lower skill level if there is a tool that would make the job easier. That being said, there might be a point at which you no longer feel like using a router to make that rabbit joint that you might want to use a chisel and a handsaw. And that's different. That's like actually taking the refinement of your brain's ability to break this build apart into multiple pieces and spend more time hand working each of those pieces. And to be totally frank, I have in the past year used a file to do things I would long ago use the mill for. And I've done that because of all the filing I've seen on the YouTube channel Clickspring. And Chris has inspired me to use a file much, much more. And that handwork of the file has given me way more finesse than I can get on the mill under certain circumstances and under specific conditions. But that's not what you're asking. You're asking, should you suffer for your uh, uh, lower skill level or use a tool that makes the thing easy. And I'm a huge advocate of using a tool that makes the thing easy. Later on, when you get better, you can go back and build those hand skills that you might not currently have. But the best way to build those hand skills is to really be able to hold the build in your head. The reason that it, when you watch those YouTube videos, and specifically the ones of Japanese carpenters making those crazy joints, all the pencil marks and the little, and then they take the saw and they make all these things and then they chisel stuff out and this, this, this joint goes together. The only reason that works is not because they're following a guide. It's because they have the experience and institutional knowledge to hold all of the facets of that joinery in their head. And that just comes with experience. So use the easy tool. 
build the ability to hold the thing in your head. And then you start to cut loose and maybe use more difficult methods because they feel more authentic to you. Uh, Nick Butler says, thank you for your comments about props UK and its students over here in the UK. Hey, dudes, I had no idea that there was a props degree to be gotten in the UK. And as soon as I can fly anywhere, if you guys want to bring me out, I want to teach. All right. I'm ready. Send me in coach. I'm <laughs> I, I, I think I tweeted right away. I want to teach there. And this is completely completely true. We, we're going to have to work this out. I'm very excited about the idea that there is a degree in prop making. Tim Tam Shortage. Now that's a name. Tim Tam Shortage. For those of you who don't know, Tim Tams are like the national cookie of Australia. They are a chocolate, chocolate covered uh, cookie. The Tim Tams are amazing. Go get Tim Tams. If you if you can get a Tim Tam, get a Tim Tam. And if you have Tim Tams, I'm just going to tell you about the Tim Tam Slam. And once you take a cup of warm milk and you bite off opposite corners of the Tim Tam and you suck it like a straw. You suck the milk into the Tim Tam like a straw. Can't take too long. The moment the milk hits your lips, you got to shove the whole cookie in your mouth because it's ready to dissolve into a million pieces. Tim Tam Slam. I'm Yeah. So Tim Tam Shortage asks... <sighs> Uh, how do you get to a level of trusting yourself with projects? I'm having a hard time with my confidence of project ideas. You just got to do it. I mean, you got to know that the first thing, the first version is probably going to suck. Yeah, Andrew Stanton said this to me about doing story meetings with his teams in the early stages of working on a big film. Andrew directed Finding Dory and Wally. And Andrew said, you know, he tells his story teams, this pass is going to suck. You're going to read it later and you're going to hate it. And it's part of the process. And you're just going to have to go through it because you can't get around it. And he's so, 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 so right. Um, so when you say projects, I'm assuming that you're talking about you want to execute a thing and it involves multiple parts and pieces and you're having a hard time having the confidence to embark on executing that. I'm taking that as my assumption of what you mean by project. And, you know, when I am not confident in how a project is going to go, I keep making lists. I keep making more and more lists. I keep doing research. I watch YouTube videos. I read people's take on it. I go do research and find old, old material on it if I can. And eventually there comes a point at which I have the information I need to start. Like that, that's definitely a moment at which you can identify. There's a moment at which it's just time you've gathered all the information you can. It's just time to start. And your execution might not satisfy you. That's, you gotta be ready for that. That's, that's the possible outcome every time you embark on making something. And many of the things I make, the first version of it, does not satisfy me at all. But it gets me to a certain point. And then maybe it might even take me a couple of years to get mad enough about that first one to make a second one. Blade Runner Gun, I made my first one at 18, my second one at 25, my third one at 45. Yeah, I mean, some of these things take a long time to come to fruition. But just keep on doing it. Just keep on... The best thing you can do is execute. Keep executing. Keep on iterating. Plan to build it three times and keep on iterating. And when you finish, you're not going to want to do it again. But a couple of days later, you might have the energy. It might take a couple of days. It might take a couple of months. For me, sometimes it's taken a couple of years. But keep iterating. That's, that's the thing. Um, before I take one last question, I want to thank everyone for participating in this, or especially in the super chat. I am sorry that I could not get to everyone. This is 90 minutes just passed like that. I, st I still can't quite snap with, with this finger. Oh, that's the one I tore up on the lathe here. Uh, and it's the one I smashed. Everyone of you guys all noticed the black nail. So now the nail fell off and now you can see that line. That's where it's growing back, but I still, yeah, it's just not working. Uh, 90 minutes went like that. I apologize I couldn't get to everyone, but seriously, thank you guys for all jumping in and super chat and participating. I think this was a successful experiment. Uh, and 
seriously, I want to thank my friend and colleague and master science communicator, Kyle Hill. Uh, Kyle is a deep friend of Tested and an excellent friend of mine and an excellent human. He guided through, guided us through this new new type of streaming uh, and was just fabulous. He has a live stream about a half hour from now, by the way, uh, and you should check it out. Okay, here comes the last comment. Marcus Adams says, to future Adam, don't trip over the crank on the floor. I will not, Marcus. I'll put this back where it belongs. Um, thank you guys so much. This has been wonderful. And I will, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next week. Signing. This is Adam signing off. Stay safe. Still stay at some distance from each other. And I trust that you and yours are all help healthy and moving through this with real consciousness and spirit. I love all you guys. Cheers. All right. End stream. Here we go.